got some good readings of here to look at, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. The Lord be with you. And now, let us pray. Gracious Lord, who have given us these holy scriptures, that we may read, learn, and inwardly digest. Sometimes they do feel like a sword, a sword that pierces the soul, a sword that wakes us up and has us choose. As you talk to us through these scriptures today about the choices we have, may we make strong choices, faithful choices, passionate choices, and all for your name's sake. Amen. 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 We're on track to. We're on track to. We're on track to. Exactly. Um, and so uh, we we start with the prophet Jeremiah today. We end up with the psalm. We. Spend a little more time in, in Paul's letter to the Romans. And then we continue the discourse on discipleship uh, that Jesus has talked about. Um, I think I actually want to start with the gospel. We're going to okay. put it down a little bit. Um, because this, is, as my prayer was suggesting, Jesus is letting the disciples know that they have choices to make. And, and how they live with it, and that God has choices. Uh, a lot of the passages we read, like from a couple of weeks ago, had a lot about mercy, a lot about love, a lot about grace. This is not one of those passages. <laughs> this is one about the, the harder decisions that people who actually become followers of, of Jesus are faced with. Sometimes, rarely, but sometimes in ways where their life is truly on the line. And other times where their eternal life is on the line. And so that's part of that's part of what we have today. Who would like to read this passage for us? I'll read it. Thank you, Macy. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to the twelve disciples, a disciple is not above the teacher nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house um, Beelzebub, well, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the, fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You're of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace for a sword. Come to set a man. Against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter in law against her mother in law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of all of me, is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. All right, what do you make of these, uh, these words of warning? <laughs> ouch. Pretty. What's the ouch for you, Pam? The ouch for me is is the pitting, you know, family against, like, mm -hmm. you know, if your family's more important to you, then um, I, you're you're not worthy of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I feel like I, I, I struggle with that, you know, because especially I think mothers are just, you know, so protective of their children and engaged in their children's lives. And I think I gave my children, they were a gift. So I struggle with thinking I'm not worthy of being a follower of Christ because I, I, I do in terms of time and you know thinking of yeah I mean I'm trying to think how in what ways do I put them above above him um, but there are plenty of ways I don't know for sure this but I think what do you think just trying to make the point very I certainly don't believe Jesus is trying to say don't love your family right right, right. 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 just talking about how important it is to truly put him first well, and this feels to me an extension of the first commandment love God with all of your heart soul mind and strength and, love your and that, that, that love is be one's primary love in the world yeah and Jesus has chosen family ties because those are generally the strongest. Yeah. There's something in our brains and genetic makeup, right? That, uh, you know, the mama bear feature. Well, mama bears are the mama bears. You know, you live up here. Don't forget between a mama and a baby cubs. And because there's the love, there's the protection, there is a, there's the care that is in that. One might also say, don't get between God and God's children because God has, has a love stronger than a a mama bear in those kind of ways. But it does make us think what what other things do we love? It's for some is athletics, for some it's their job. It's all the all those things that come in between us and God. Those things during Lent which we are charged to to give up, to change parties, to shift gears, to say, okay, it's not about giving up chocolate, which is really just an extension of I want a smaller belly, but it's about something that as this is, I'm spending time on this, sort of as Maisie is saying, and I'm not spending time with God. So if I give this up, that frees up the time that I can spend with God. And maybe that is social media, or maybe yeah. Yeah. maybe for some reason that is chocolate, because if you're obsessed with that and not obsessed with God and this, this way of, of looking at life, you sort of lost touch with this fear that Jesus is bringing up about the one who can uh, take both body and soul and destroy it in hell. So these are these are really strong words of, yes, of warning. Are, and that hard, the other hard thing in here is that I don't come to bring peace of a sword and turn son against father and daughter against mother and um, it's real successful. <laughs> but we also know that Jesus, is, as far as we know in the scriptures, never actually carried a sword. Right, right. I mean, I know that people doesn't mean put down it in that a sword. Way. Right, yeah. but this, it, a sword is something that divides, but it, it is. severs, it cuts. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a place in Hebrews that talks about scripture being sharper than any double edged sword, and it, it splits. It, and if Jesus is the incarnate word of God, then Jesus is the one who, who splits it's and divides, right? You think about that, right? the story with Solomon, right? You got yeah. Two, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that great wisdom. He, he didn't continue wisdom very long after that, in my opinion. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. that, was, that particular choice was a, was a wise choice. It's um, yes. been remembered down yeah. through the ages. That's right. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think, you know, he's trying to say that we are all God's children, so we're all a family in that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and thinking of traditional families back then, and even in our day and age, although traditional families can look a lot different mm -hmm. nowadays, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's more responsibility for us, ministry for us, service for us than just our own family. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
couple of verses in here that uh, sort of stand alone, but when I was a very young person, I heard a uh, sermon that emphasized these two that made an impression on me. One of them is, well, it says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are numbered. And the preacher went on to say that um, in, in, in the context of God being an all-knowing God and God caring for even the sparrows and all creatures. Mm -hmm. When I want to talk about 600,000 hairs, <laughs> yeah. blondes and so forth, you know, yeah. whether that's entirely accurate or not, I don't know. He was a very young person. I always remember that, that my uh, goodness, <laughs> even the hair falls without God knowing it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, amidst this this very challenging, challenging it's an extremely Ooh. comforting Christ. phrase. Mm -hmm. Even the hairs on your head, even if those hairs are diminishing over time. Right. <laughs> yeah, still, He's still watching. Know, still, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, he um, knows that. He knows everything. He knows everything. I just have to get impressed to you. When I was a child, I heard somewhere, um, I don't know whether it was Mahalia Jackson or who it was, seeing his eyes on the sparrows, so I know he watches me. Mm -hmm. And it just, I mean, I, it just went to my heart, and I've always loved it. And it's been done twice in our church. Um, the the flutist, what's her name? Bonnie. 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 That's right. Did it, um, and then of course Tiffany sang it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's beautiful. But it's also such a beautiful thought that his eyes on the sparrow, so I know he's watching me. I love that you remember that, and you know, like think back. Right. In, everybody has some sort of memory like that, that mm -hmm. somebody said or did something or, you know, mm -hmm. I love that. So you don't know what's sticking with the time. Mm -hmm. you know. And the, the, the corollary, I think, that might be implied here is that this is the extent to which God loves us. He's even counting the hairs on our head. To what extent then do we love God? Yeah. Can, can we love him back with that amount of concentration and focus and determination um, to count the hairs on one's head? A number you can never get right. You know, sometimes you're just counting a few things. I counted it. I got 18 counting it. What do I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Am I get it right? It's getting easier and easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but no, that's that's very true. And to be not afraid, we get that a lot in scripture in different ways. Um, so this is not being afraid of the harm. They're, they're being called to this courageous life to go out and to preach, and that preaching will mean rejection. And sometimes that rejection will mean imprisonment, and sometimes that imprisonment will mean death, just like Jesus suffered that. When we get to the Romans mm -hmm. passage, again, it's that idea of sharing. Mm -hmm. That you're, you're sharing in the stuff of Christ and the bad stuff, which means you get to share in the good stuff. The sharing is also at the beginning of this when he talks about no student is above the teacher and no slave is above the master. It's as much to be, to be like them. You're being on an even even par, even place with them, but there's no sense of greater or less than me. It strikes me as interesting that the writer um, says, don't be afraid of people who can hurt you, let's see if has it said. Um, Do not fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And then, you know, down here he says, don't be afraid. <laughs> right. It's so kind. Well, yeah, you're not, it's you know, sort of, you're missing the direct object if, the, if you're doing talking about the camera. Do not be afraid 
of other people. Don't be afraid of God. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, what, what are you not to be afraid of? And, and I always, you know, when it's talking about fearing God, I always just substitute awe, you know, be in awe of God. Not, then we're not supposed to be afraid of the choice right. that we right. think of as being. Mm -hmm. and, and some will look at that, and I wonder, and we're called to, to rethink our Christianity. If we don't talk about hell, if we don't talk about fear, have we just made Christianity soft? Ooh, easy. Have we made our faith easy? Ooh. And isn't this nice to be? Because <laughs> at my fears, just give me a head rub, Jesus, and count mm. my head and hands on my head, and, and everything's going to be up. No, that there is there is a lot there's a lot more to it in sure. this in those ways. Yeah. All right, so with that in mind, let's uh, move up to Romans. And Paul, uh, without quoting Jesus, as I said time and time again, this class is a rare instance for Paul to even quote Jesus, because he's interested more in what Jesus did than what Jesus said. Um, but he is talking then about what Jesus did for us and then how we should be doing the same. So there is a a real thematic parallel between your gospel and your Romans lesson. Uh, somebody up there on, on the screen, or, or Morris is. All right, Morris is going to read it for us. We'll get you some someone at home to read the Jeremiah. Thank you, Morris. Okay. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Should we continue to, in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we? who died to sin, go on living in it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism uh, in the death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed. We might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died he died to sin once for all. With the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Thank you. I think about this passage a little bit and we're a little to that other famous passage but I do not that for me is is much more human <laughs> and we're able to understand that than what is you know we, we've got both of those people in us versus this which again is is a total reorientation consider yourselves dead to sin every little part of yourself Maybe you've got 80% of it under control, or maybe even if you're lucky, 90% of it under control. But that 10%, you just have to consider, just keep working in death, death to sin, death to sin, alive to Christ, alive to Christ, alive to Christ. And it's, um, you know, they're, they're both applicable, I think, as we, as we take our steps, as we take our breaths day by day. What is it that, um, that is clinging to the old and not dying to self? That what is there with that? Thank you for being generous. Ten percent. Ten percent. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I don't know who's got that. <laughs> so this is, um, you know, Paul is making his case and is, is making a great argument, or in the Christian sense of the word, an apologetic, an apology to understand the faith. Why has Christ made the difference, and why? In this case, too, does baptism make a difference? Well, in our baptisms, we die to self. 
you know, it's, it's always nice when you're reading a book or a movie or seeing a movie. Can we skip the bad part and just get to the good part? <laughs> well, this is saying, no, you're not going to skip the bad part. Because if you're going to have new life, that means there has to have been a death. And then that's the bad part. Those are the, those are the choices that we make. And this um, is one of our beautiful sort of Easter hymns that would we, be pulled together. It's called the Pascha Nostrum. And we, we say this in church during the season of Easter this week. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death will no longer have dominion. That's the, the beauty of this gift of Christ. Death until Christ, all the point, and what we know is death had dominion over all creation. There's as much dying in the world each day as there is living. There's life and death. It's 50-50. There's all, always, always, always death going on. Um, whether it's a, a tree that's dying, a bird that's dying, a human being that's dying, there, there's all kinds of death. Um, but the, that dominion of death is what allows anybody who might be on their deathbed or in the throes of a bad disease or anything to remember that no, the death and death has been broken for us. Yes, we want to hold on to our life. But more and more, people are making pastoral choices, conscious choices. It's not the length of days, but the quality of days they will choose because they know that death no longer has dominion over them. Death to the body may happen, but like when Jesus is saying, death to the soul has not. Or be mindful of the one who can bring death to body and soul and, and live our lives that way. But in a very hopeful way, Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God and Jesus Christ. But again, eternal life is something that begins now. Right. This being alive with Christ, not something that happens only at our physical death. It, it precedes our physical death. Amazing. Um, can you talk about, um, in back to our baptism, we are, we got a self, right? I mean, yes. that's what. That's part of, yes, that's part of what's happening, right. And I think of, um, I'm trying to, to um, understand it, because we baptize <laughs> infants. Right, right. Dying to self is a, a thing done unto us by God, or I think of dying to self as when we move to the point in our lives where we realize that we we want to commit our lives to make a decision to be uh, in relationship with God, mm -hmm. and and that when we do that, we are acknowledging that we are no longer in control, but God is. That's sort of what that itself means. That what we attempt to to have is that kind of right. We we turn again, so like the Lord that will be done. Yeah. It's uh, my will be done. So that's, that's living to self. Yeah. Might be one way to right. describe it. Is, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do in life to another person with my wallet, with my blah, 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 and without any care for God or our neighbors. Now, some people can live a very moral life mm -hmm. and they're, they mm -hmm. love their neighbors and they take care of people and they're not hurting anybody in how they go through things. But in, in terms of their relationship with God, they are not choosing a will outside of their own. They're still choosing their will, albeit a moral will, the way to live. Hmm. Um, so morality and Christianity aren't the same. They're, they're interwoven because of the things and the morality Jesus asked us to have. And, the, and, and as Christians, morality is a response to God's grace hmm. in us that we want to please him and want to. It's not because... Uh, we get along better in the world if we are kind of people. That's a right. part of his calling. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the motivation or the, and the orientation are a little bit different between between those two. Well, but I guess I'm just thinking about baptizing infants and how dying to self applies. Um, sure, because they have most of them don't have that level of consciousness, right? At age <laughs> no. six months or eight months. <laughs> Or, at, or three days. Or three days, or at five years, 
maybe even at 15 years, <laughs> yeah. or maybe even at 20. I mean, what does it what yeah. does it really mean? Yeah. You, you, you begin to get the hang of what that means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea with the church baptizing infants is practical and that it happened in the Bible, and not frequently, but it did, but also that then once in the community of faith, once with other baptized people, you learn to die to self along the way. Right. You're no likely to make that. You, you may not even develop those other habits. Yeah. Because you are you're in that community and you're you're learning to, to give up things for others, give up things for God, give up your own will in those ways. Thank goodness for forgiveness. You know what's interesting? <laughs> That Paul repeats that same uh, sentence in uh, Romans 14. If you if you if we live, we live to the Lord, and we die, we die to the Lord. He's yeah, same letter, right? In Romans, yeah. yeah. Martin's got his hand. Yes, Martin. Thank you, and then Collins. Oh, is it just Martin? Okay, Martin. I'm struggling with the uh, the integration in a way of sinfulness and selfishness or selfishness. I I don't see the self as ungodly. I don't see the self as not Christ-like. I don't see the separation. I see the goal to integrate the two, but to kill one and put yourself in a place where you're subject to some notion of what God is, as opposed to continually revealing God in yourself, yourself and God. I, 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 I don't. It feels very harsh. You talk about the sword. Yeah, I, 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 I don't quite get there. Um, I think that understanding and seeing those parts of yourself that are destructive that disconnect you from God, or your understanding of God, is being something you've got to deal with. But, but. To presume to know God's will 100% gives you license to do whatever you damn well want to, maybe, because you're saying that you are, you are doing God's will, whether you really are or not. I think the continuous quest is almost more important than the realization of a particular uh, self-generated uh, uh, goal. So I, I'm, I'm just right. with it. <clears throat> I see where you're coming from. And actually, this morning, one of the commentaries I was reading about this passage and about the last line of the gospel, which is for those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it, was talking about uh, preachers. And we, we've all seen the preachers on television who say, Send me your money. <laughs> sort of entrepreneurial preachers, right? <laughs> and what goes up will be God's and what comes down will be mine. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and and they, they've got nice limos and jet planes <laughs> and all these other kind of things that it, it, it seems to be antithetical to many, many points in the gospel. <laughs> well, then you have maybe the medium grade folks like me who this is my livelihood. This is what I, this is what I do. And there is there is salary and compensation involved and things like that. And you hear the gospel like we heard last week. You received it without paying for it. Give it without taking money for it. It's like, okay, how does that work? And I was talking to, uh, actually, at my father-in-law's funeral uh, at, at the wake this past week, one of his sons is a Baptist minister. And they talked about serving, having served a very poor church for a long time. Because that's what they felt. This is the group they felt called to do. And now later in life, they're in a better place, making a little more money, able to travel, able to do some things like that. So I think Martin, to, to that point, when when we think about missionary life, and is it, am I am I really doing this for God, or am I really doing this to line my pockets in that in, in whatever ministry that is? That could be a nonprofit. That could be whatever job you choose. Am I doing this? <clears throat> am I being a doctor because I really want to care for people? Or am I being a doctor because I've seen how doctors live and I want to have those houses and those cars and those that lifestyle? I mean, it's, it's the same 
type of thing that, that can come with it. So you and I would agree with you, Martin, that anyone who claims to know God's will at 100% um, is is mistaken. But I, at the same time, I think that the, the continuous integration that you're talking about, dying to self, and at least seeking that will of God, and what is it? We seek it in scripture, we seek it in sacrament, we seek it in, in loving one another, and, and sometimes it's easier to see from the outside than from the inside. Um, it, it's, it's, it's tricky, just as these teachings are tricky, both from Paul and Jesus. Those who will find their life and need to lose it. And, and what exactly does that mean? It doesn't mean kill yourself, lose your physical heartbeat, but it, it does mean give up something of the self-driven uh, part that we have. Collins, I see your hand up. Yes, uh, in a partial response to Martin and in honor of Laura, I approached this uh, in looking at the past, present, and the future in the tenses. And in verse 5, Martin, there is the word certainly. And in verse 5 is the real gem in this particular reading, and it's the word resurrection which obviously is a future tense. And I think, Martin, uh, that certainly uh, we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. And I think it's important to uh, surround all of the word resurrection with death, dying, baptism. Uh, but I think it's most important that we recognize the certainty of that. That's good. <laughs> Any other <clears throat> thoughts? So many things have to die before they can rise, like a cedar. I always think of a cedar as a dried up little right. uh, dead looking thing. Mm -hmm. But when you put it in the ground and nourish it with, with the, what it needs to grow, it comes to life. And I think there's so many things in life that are like that. If something has to die sometimes before it can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. flourish. And, um, and I think that that's just a good analogy. I mean, we have to, we are born egocentric creatures that are in control of our lives, we think. And we get ourselves all messed up sometimes doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we do, it's often when we turn to God because we know we can't do it ourselves. <clears throat> and so that's that dying and saying, okay, I give up. I, I can't I can't run this train, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So that's sort of my understanding. All right, let's move on to Jeremiah. Jeremiah um, is a, a disciple in his, in his own way, loosely described as a disciple if you're a prophet, if you've been called by God to go out and speak. And, and Jeremiah is describing some of his, um, his, his call to speak. And he describes it in a, in a beautiful way. Um, he talks about holding it in. But the more, if he, if he were to hold it in, this desire to speak because he's worried about persecutions, it becomes something that's burning within him that just has got to come out regardless of the peril that he faces. And so this sort of posits this whole discipleship piece is, well, why would we hold back? Why would we hold our tongue? Isn't it just bursting from within us to, to be able to say something? So that this is some of a, a poetic way and a uh, Hebrew scripture way to describe some of the same things that Paul describes himself uh, in other parts of his writings and, and that Jesus is directing the disciples to do. Basically, don't hold it in. You know, let it let it out. Who on the who at home there on the screen could read for us? I'd be happy to. Okay, Laura, thank you. I have a reading from the 20th chapter of Jeremiah. O oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. 
I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous you see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing praise to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Say what, Maisie? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt that. I just said I'd hate to have his close friends. His close friends are trying to get <laughs> retribution and leak. Well, yeah, they're looking for him to stumble. Yeah. And they're looking for him to be in, enticed. Um, maybe they aren't close friends, but the, the people who have been, I mean, it's the same as the family decision, right, in the gospel. Father against son, mother against daughter, whatever else. These, this is the next level of relationships. We get to choose our friends, but not our family. And this guy's chosen friends who um, just want to, just wanted of to it. shut up. Just want to shut up. Maybe they are jealous. Revenge on them. Yeah. Um, and, he, and then he asked for revenge on them. So how, how close to a friend he is on that? Oh, my persecutors, they can be destroyed. It's fine. Um, so the, the, the persecutors and the evildoers described in this passage become, and I think Jesus uses the term foes. They're in opposition. They're living in opposition. They may not be out to get you in the way that evildoers are or persecutors are, but you certainly aren't being uh, embraced, welcomed, supported. supported, and all those other kind of things. Um, I guess support's a great way to, to look at it. This is who, it, but at the same time, even if he says, "Okay, I do want to be my, with my friends," which means I know I'm not going to get to talk about this, mm -hmm. um, that he can't do it. Mm -hmm. He can't do it. It's like a burning fire within his bones that just has to has to come out. If if you look at uh, the time of Jeremiah. Most all of the prophets, um, the church, quote unquote, the uh, Jewish leaders, and those that followed them uh, were constantly at battle with the prophets mm. because prophets said you got to do good things, and they wanted to, you know, wear the nice robes. They wanted to have status yeah but they wanted a, a, a mortal world instead of a, a spiritual world and the prophets are out there going no you don't understand the mortal world will lead you to you know death and destruction to violence and the spiritual world will lead you to God and and Again, if you look at the lives of the prophets, that was a common um, occurrence. The prophets were not liked at all because they wanted the people to be better. It also, it all, that also brought on destruction to them as well when they spoke about God because people weren't 
didn't want to hear it. And, um, talking about the violence that comes um, from that. Yeah, again, if you look at the lives of the prophets, um, they had a tendency not to live out a normal <laughs> Might get swallowed up by a whale. <laughs> yeah, but he got spit out. <laughs> well, true. Uh, but it, it's, Martin uh, has it. No. <clears throat> okay, Martin. I, I read this to some extent as being a very modern take, and the prophet. All, all I got to do is substitute Daniel Ellsberg for Jeremiah. I mean, he was in the Pentagon, and when he turned and he told the truth and revealed their secrets, they wanted nothing to do with him. They, they wanted to revile him. And I think one of the most moving reportings of his death was a return to the fact that his neighbors, Ellsberg's neighbors, took over their neighborhood and protected the street so that the police and the CIA and nobody could threaten his life. His neighbors rose up to say, this is, he's one of us. He's telling us what we need to know. And institutional forgiveness or institutional um, wrongdoing, I think, is a lot of what Jeremiah is talking about, not just uh, your individual heart or your individual soul. It's the whole community. And, and, and the community needs to rethink and revisit, not a private, but a public um affirmation of, of what your goals are. And I, I find it extraordinary. Good point. Well, let's, uh, for those who are here in the, in the room, let's read in unison Psalm 69. We just have... <laughs> Uh, verses 8 through 11, and then 18 through 20. And you'll see how much this psalm uh, echoes the themes of the things that we have just been talking about. Surely, for your sake, I have suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, and alien to my mother's children. Steel from your house has eaten me up. The storm of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. Answer me, O Lord, for your lost time. In your great compassion, turn to me. I not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer to me. For I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me, because of my enemies deliver me. And again, some of Paul's points are baptism delivers us. To Collins's point, resurrection delivers us. Um, losing one's life, as Jesus was saying is a form of deliverance instead of gaining one's life only to lose it, which is not deliverance. But this whole becoming a stranger to one's own kindred is very much about what Jesus said. Um, and you remember when he turned the tables over, Jesus did in the marketplace. Uh, I think this is the passage that was quoted, zeal for my father's house has eaten me up because he even though he knew that would bring him persecution, which it did. And that's one of the things all four gospelers agree upon is that the turning of the tables in the temple and upsetting the institution, much as sort of Martin is talking about, is, is one of the things that got Jesus in trouble, just as it got Jeremiah in trouble or Amos in trouble or any number of other people along the way. You know, it seems to me that this is a strong cry of anguish, but then it's also in the last verse a strong cry of faith that he, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't give up, draw near to me and redeem me, mm -hmm. that he has confidence that mm -hmm. he is doing what the Lord requires and that he will be protected. His redemption after 
the conflict, um, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it were just persecution for talking about Jesus or um, upsetting the uh, tables, um, if there was nothing but persecution as a result, why, it's sort of, why do it? <laughs> But there is redemption and there is you know joy or peace or something that God uh, uses that courage to I don't know yeah but there's something in it for us <laughs> even if we don't always see it right away mm -hmm. but being faithful to him issues in in good things. Mm -hmm. And difficult things. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, one of the things that comes to mind in this is that the, the Old Testament, and this is broad brushstrokes oversimplifying, but the Old Testament we have today of Jeremiah and the Psalm talks about deliver me from my enemies, crush them, let me win over them, etc., etc. <laughs> the New Testament that we have, not in the passages we have, but in both Paul and Jesus talk about when Jesus says, pray for your enemies. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bless those who persecute you. Paul saying says the same type of things, and it, it, that somehow there's the shift of. Now you're not praying for your enemies to succeed. <laughs> if, if if someone is persecuting you, you're praying that their heart changes, mm -hmm. that they understand perspective differently, that they open their eyes, that they become less less self-willed. All those things. That's the praying for them, but it's not. You're not praying for their destruction. Right. You're, you're praying for their turnabout. Just, just for their redemption. Right. <laughs> and it is the difference between so much of the Old Testament and, and when Jesus came, the the love for all people and the and it's just a difference in how we treat our enemies is yeah. a lot of it. When the Ukrainian war broke out, we um and in DOK we were like, you know, how do we pray for Putin? Right. Mm -hmm. And so our prayer is for God to soften his heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, there would be a lot of other things you'd want to think. <laughs> My sure, goodness. Sure. Like, you know, I want him to get his. But, you know, that's the prayer. Yeah, that's so that's the human side. And maybe that is then the heavenly side. The right. kingdom side is for his heart to change, for him to cease and desist, mm -hmm. to, to choose, make better choices. The human side is, you know, this is this. That's what make it easy, right? Well, no, then because just someone else comes in and takes his place, right. and it, everything continues. I mean, that that's 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 part of what. Well, it is. and and through that process of us talking about that, it it, it sort of convicted me, mm -hmm. you know, of, mm -hmm. of my sin, if you will, mm -hmm. and so then it's redemption for me as well, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's when when we do the hard thing in His name, there's redemption. For us, even if it, we don't see, it, it, we don't see Putin's heart change yet, but it, 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 it was good for your soul mm -hmm. to come to the place where you could pray for him. And in terms of the, the gospel passage we did read, what is it to think that God cares for Putin more than a hundred sparrows? Mm -hmm. Just like this. The mm -hmm. hundred sparrows counting every hair on his head. Right. Just like it's ours, hard. just like his. It is hard. And then it, it makes you hard. wonder where has God placed you or where will God place you that you might be doing his work in someone's life. Right. Mm -hmm. Without even knowing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the, the harder point, again, back to the priesthood thing I thought about this a while ago is, you know, you, you have ministers like Billy Graham who have had the the conversations with a number of presidents mm -hmm. and were, was he in some of those situations saddling up to power or was he in some situations no behind closed doors being able to say x y and z about the of some war or some social program or some who knows who knows what you're doing and how if you are as a christian not just a minister but if you are as a christian by somebody um, you know, if you get to play golf with Trump or golf with Biden, just to make it equal, right? Okay. Well, do you take that opportunity to 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 say something or not? And, and what would what would you say that would be more 
kingdom of God inclined than kingdom of this world. How many rounds of golf are you playing? Well, that's the thing. And that's the people who don't want to hear it. And, yeah. that's, and that's where the sword comes in. And I have four daughters who don't like to hear me tell them what, you know, what I think sometimes. Right. You know, and I, I say, if you're going to ask me, I only have one answer when it comes right down to it. Mm -hmm. I can give them all my best common sense answers to their problems. But mm -hmm. when they say, yes, mom, but I say, okay, you don't want to hear this. This is my only answer. Mm -hmm. God is, is what you have to turn. Right. And, um, and they kind of, you know, I picture them rolling their eyes. So, but that's gotten better as time has gone on. Yeah. So. And I have, like you, I have, I have a daughter who would not describe herself as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Do we not associate with each other? Of course not. Of course we. Uh, we had a great Father's Day together, all yeah. this kind of thing. Yeah. And we do it's so painful. Good. And it's, it's it, there's a division. There but is there a, is a division. Yeah. But at some point, the, we, we, we still choose to love each other and to be together. Right. And, you know, maybe something will come of that. Yeah. And that, that's, that's part of it where I think those yeah, PKs are particularly bad about it. They, they can be, or they can be particularly good. Yeah, they can be, but four out of four? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, think, I think sometimes God gives you those kind of challenges, or those, you know, yes. they happen in your life yeah. because then it's a ministry to someone else because you've had that personal experience. That you can share it with someone, yeah. mm -hmm. like you just did, amazing, just did. right, right. You know, and that could make a world of difference to somebody. Right, and that's, I think, a point in reading this. Conversations we have, we we choose to bring up something, even if it might be a little bit difficult. Um, but then we're also in a listening point stance. I mean, part of what Morris is saying is they said they're not listening. Well, to what extent are we not listening? Mm -hmm. What are, so are we not listening to these words or to other situations that are going on? And then how can we be that person who is okay? Maybe I did have a little too much ego involved. I'm going to be a priest, and my children will believe, and that's. About me looking good in the community because my family are believers versus the truth of the of the situation of what they are. Was this one of David's? Uh, was this written by David? We have never really know exactly yeah. who the, yeah. they, a lot of them are attributed. Even if it's Paul or Matthew or David, it's not as important as, as who wrote it as it is, is considered Holy Scripture. But yes, we attribute them to it. It gets home lots of times. It does. It does. All right. Anything else for us today? That old human nature is still the same. BC and Mm -hmm. BC and AD, AD, that's right, that's right. And the love of God is the same. Be yes. not afraid. Remember that. That's the thing. That's the. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we just lost them. There's, there's Good Shepherd trying to come back. Probably just to say goodbye. <laughs> Doesn't change is is God. They're back. Well, I'm sorry for those online. If you can even hear me now, we have um, we haven't had the most stable of internet connections. Uh, but I'm, I thank you for sticking for sticking with us. Uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks. 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 Thanks.